right? You get punches like, what are you going to do about that punch that just happened? What was that lesson? What was that? You got hit in your face, but what, what was that hit in the face? What, 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 what was that hit in the face for you to realize, right? A lot of people during this pandemic, they lost a lot of people. They lost a lot of clients, right? They lost a lot of, of employees. But what, this, what the pandemic did, I feel, is taught them what fat you should have trimmed from the beginning. What money was you wasting? How could you be more innovative? How you can stop being a one-legged stool instead of having just one source of uh, uh, income or business model. Hi, it's Robin Sharma, and you're tuning in to the Millionaire Student Show with Sasha. 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 everyone welcome to another episode on the millionaire student show where i get the opportunity to pick the minds of this generation's thought leaders change makers disruptors innovators and inspirations dissect their story from the pain they went through the price they paid and what their prize looks like today i formulated the millionaire student self-development system and company because this is what i was searching for when I first entered the entrepreneurial world at 17 years old, my mission and purpose is to serve you with virtual mentorship to consciously make your clock tick without taking the thunder away from today's guest. He started dancing when he was 11 years old and took his love of performing into the rap group he formed with his brothers, Pretty Ricky. They disrupted the music industry by selling more than 30 million albums, which went platinum, including two other platinum singles. Their album was number one for five consecutive weeks on both the hip hop and R&B charts. Eventually, he was intrigued by the business possibilities of social media. He turned his social media expertise to become the founder and CEO of Adwazar, the dominant social media brand in the urban music space. The company now deals with major brands and corporations, athletes, merchandising deals, and more. The Millionaire Students, please help me in welcoming today's guest. Inc. named him the greatest and most inspiring entrepreneurs. Huffington Post named him top marketing gurus to watch by ranks among the top five most influential entrepreneurs in tech and music. And he was honored as the innovator of the year by Black Enterprise, Spectacular Smith. <laughs> Spec, thank you for being on the Millionaire Student Show today. I truly appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks for having me, man. In this show, we dissect the pain that my guests went through in life as well as the price they paid before they experienced their prize. So how did it all begin for you? So for me, it all started from just being a kid infatuated with, you know, business at a young age, seeing my mom do a hustling thing, selling like back in the day, they used to call it Avon crystals. And she used to sell different products and stuff like that. She was a manager at a business, but she had different side hustles. So I used to see my mom selling all of these items. So it kind of put that bug into me too, saying that, you know what, if I see my mom doing this, you know, I can do something, I can do something similar or the same thing. So I used to go to school and they used to have these brochures of like candy bars that you can sell and you can get certain prizes. And I've always been competitive. So I wanted like the biggest and best prizes. So I got like $10,000 worth of candy bars and I had, I got asked everybody to help me sell it, you know, like I had my, my mom friends, you know, I had, you know, my mom, me, like everybody. And I went door to door and I'm selling all $10,000 worth of bars, went to class and I uh, was excited. They had the little seminar thing where they tell you what you won with your prize. And I turned my money in. I got a bubblegum beeper with a yo-yo for $10,000. So at that point I was like, all right. This is the first time I realized I can't work for nobody. You know, it was a highway robbery. 
uh, did all his work and I got nothing out of the deal. So from that point forward, I was like, you know what? I'm going to start working for myself. I got to sixth grade, did the same thing uh, with the candy business, had 10 people working for me, $2,000 a week at 11 years old to transitioning into a music group. That was kind of like the foundation of, of who I became to the world. Uh, but throughout doing my music stuff, I started doing my side hustles on social media too. And I learned that I can make money off of social media. So not only I'm going to be on stage and performing in front of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, but also I can be behind the scenes and make money off of social media and monetize my passion. Some nights I was making more than I was making on stage as a platinum artist, like building and monetizing social media accounts. So there's so many similarities because I can relate with what you mentioned in the direct sales industry and, you know, selling candy. I did that with chocolate fudge as well. I also did direct sales. Um, you know, I've heard you say you didn't change. You just grew up. What would you say attributed towards you growing up? Mistakes, failures, you know, going through so many trials and tribulations, peaks and valleys. As you're going through this journey, it's a lot of things you just don't know. It's a lot of unknowns. And back then, I didn't have any mentorship. I knew nothing about mentors. I wasn't reading books. I see a ton of books behind you right now. I didn't start reading books until three years ago, four years ago. Like, I didn't, like, I didn't understand that somebody can read to me. I was like, whoa. So you mean it, I don't have to sit down and go page by page and freaking read a book? Somebody would just, like, read it to me? And that's when my whole life changed. When I realized audio books is this, I started running through hundreds and hundreds of books and gaining knowledge from people who already been where I want to be at in life. And that's something I pride myself on following is the breadcrumbs to success. So once I started doing that, you know, going through my trials and tribulations, when I actually go through a moment, I can read a book that helped me with that current situation I'm going through that helped me get over that obstacle. Spec, success is messy in the middle and gorgeous at the end. What was your biggest setback for you, which actually caused you to make that comeback? It was my father. My father was the manager, the label owner, everything. And I see we made tens of millions of dollars and he just managed the money, you know, poorly and left me flat broke, nothing, homeless. He kicked me out. I had no money to my name. I had no clothes. I had nothing. Uh, my girl told me I could come stay at a house with her mom told me I could come over. And from that point forward, I realized that, you know, I had to do something, you know, I had to do something and I see what my dad did. And I, I didn't want to, I didn't, I didn't want to be in the same situation again. So I wanted to, I wanted to be the person that, that, that had my future and in my own hands, instead of having somebody else predict where my money is going to go and, and how to manage the money. So I started learning about money management, financial freedom, uh, financial literacy, and, and, and really taking things to the next level for myself. And when I started focusing on that, that's when everything changed. Cause I realized like I'm the person who sets what my future is. I set my own destiny. And when I got into that mindset, every, everything changed, everything. I started thinking things, looking at things differently. I started thinking about how can I help more people help themselves? And it, it's a saying that says, if you make enough people rich, you'll become rich. Right. So I try to figure out as many ways I can help as many people as possible, no matter if I did get rich or not, and kind of switch my mindset based on the music industry mindset, where it was all about me, 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 take, 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 you know, mess this person over, snake this person. And that was the music industry. Don't introduce them to your plug. And I had to reprogram my mindset and say, you know what? I'm going to introduce you to anybody you need help with. I'm going to give you everything that's going to help benefit you. I'm going to help you whatever situation I can help with and be a service to you, who you are as a person. And that's when I really start seeing change, not only for my life, for, for my life, but for people around me and, and, and the impact I was bringing to others. So over 90% of people hardly ever see success. They go through adversity first and you see that prosperity. You have multi-platinum records, albums, and then you start seeing success, but then internally 
you start going through adversity where you don't see the money, you don't taste the success, you don't experience what you've actually gone out and created. How did that set you up for the future, knowing that if your own dad could literally create that mess, which allowed you to create your message, then in, in the future, anyone can mess you over. Anyone could screw you over. Anyone could set you up. I think it was great that I went through that. You know, the fact that I made all that money and and came out the end with nothing. It just taught it just taught me that it's not all about money, you know, to have happiness. And it also showed me that if you lose it, you can get it back. And once you got that mindset, it's you you become unstoppable because nothing can hurt me. I'm, I'm a, you can't hurt me. David Goggins, and that's a great book too. It's like you can't hurt me. No matter what you do, you cannot break me. You can take all of my money. You can take all of my materialistic stuff. You, but when, when I have this, a brain, and I got heart, it's, hard, it's, it's literally hard to do anything to me because nothing will phase me. It don't matter. So you can't drive me based on what you can make me. You can't drive my, my emotions or who I am as a person based on materialistic things. So I would never be in a position where you can try to manipulate me or, or, or push me to something that I know is not true to who I am as a person because it's not about money. It doesn't matter. Money is like nothing, right? And money is nothing. But the reality is relationships are something, you know, building relationships, having integrity, having morals, right? Having a support system. That's the true meaning of wealth, right? And it's not monetary. So when I realized that and I went flat broke, I was like, all right, I want to be successful. And by me being successful comes money. But when the money comes, I have to use it responsibly and the credibility and the, and the actual power I end up receiving because of money. Now it's about what I do with that power and that money to impact the world. And only when people actually go through it, exactly what you went through with me, was my parents getting divorced when I was two years old, that pain creates that passion where you never want to go back to normality. There's no point of return ever again. The masses only tend to remember your name when you're in the spotlight, when you have a hit, when you're on the come up or even at the pinnacle. What mindset did you have to develop during the darkest point and most challenging period of your career? Honestly, I never really thought about any of that. You know, my mind never went into a dark spot. It just went into a motivational spot because I just knew that it, was, it wasn't over for me. I never felt like this is the end of the world. I just know it's, it's a lesson in every tragedy. And when I understood that, nothing can stop me. I won't go into that dark place because I know this is just a lesson. Yeah, it's, a, it's an L right now, but that L stands for lesson, right? And you want to learn as, as much as you can until you take the L off of that learn and earn. And that's what I do. So I would never be stopped because everything happens for a reason. Figure out whatever that, when you get punched in your face, it's called a counter punch, right? You get punches like, what are you going to do about that punch that just happened? What was that lesson? What was that? You got hit in your face, but what, what was that hit in the face? What, 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 what was that hit in the face for you to realize, right? A lot of people during this pandemic, they lost a lot of people. They lost a lot of clients, right? They lost a lot of, of employees. But what, this, what the pandemic did, I feel, is taught them what fat you should have trimmed from the beginning? What money was you wasting? How could you be more innovative? How you can stop being a one-legged stool instead of having just one source of uh, uh, income or business model where you can have, you know, multiple uh, uh, vertically integrating and, and having, you know, if you are manufactured, then you got the, you know, postal service that you purchased that's going to help you with the delivering your product faster and, or like, Amazon does this perfectly. They vertically integrate everything. And I think once you kind of do that and, 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 and understand that everything happens for a reason, you can kind of realize like, okay, when I 
when I went through the pandemic, this is what I learned. 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 This is what I'm going to do better. And now when the next pandemic hit or anything close to it, you're, you're bulletproof. It doesn't even matter at that point because you done seen the worst of the worst and you know how to, you battle test it. The majority of creative people are just good at creating as opposed to continuously innovating, disrupting, launching, and scaling. And you came from that creative space, although your family, your mom was in the entrepreneurial space, but what made you make that shift from music to entrepreneurship? What made you give up a passion to start chasing a different lane of passion? I wouldn't necessarily say I gave it up because last year we just got off the... Me and my group got off the highest grossing R&B tour of the year. We was number one. Um, so it's really like a hobby at this point versus my main drive because I never really wanted to be in the music industry. I got forced to be in the music industry because my father felt like I had a look and I had a, a great voice for music. And I was like, all right, cool. But it was never really my passion. Right. So it's always me wanting to get on stage and perform. That was my passion. That's still my passion. I love to entertain. I love to perform. And business was always in me. I never knew my dad. My dad was locked up for 12 years in, in prison. My mom, you know, going through a bunch of felonies, trying to take care of four kids as a single mom and, and trying to figure things out in life for us. And I see how she never stopped. She never let nothing hold her back. She never stopped, made sure she always provided for us. And that was kind of my motivation on seeing that and seeing how my mom made money. And, and then my dad got out and he was similar. Like my dad got out of prison, stayed in the back of his store for years until he ended up buying the daycare. And then from the daycare, you know, he moved to the suburbs, built his house, was, house up from the ground up and then released us as talent as, and knew nothing about the music industry. But his hustle, his drive, his grit, everything, I just seen my mom and my dad collectively come together um, not come together, but make me, you know, understand that these are two skill sets that I kind of had already in me as as DNA because I didn't know my dad and I was literally my dad, right? In, the, in terms of his drive, his hustle, his his successful mindset. And then my mom was similar to my dad. Like, so like they get all the credit, you know, they get all the credit, especially my mom just to, you know, teach me how to love, how to care and how to have, you know, uh, um, what would I say? Um, empathy to others, you know? So you learned how to monetize social media for yourself and those who had a following but couldn't convert it into revenue, especially on Twitter. What is your formula to monetize celebrities and your clients on social media? The strategy is just figuring out what do they audience like? What do they audience like? And then figure out a way to get them to engage with the content when you can get somebody to engage and you can control your audience because you build influence a lot of times people build a following but they don't build the influence so i try to focus on how can i build the influence because when you got influence you can make people move the way you want them to move if you say hey this product is hot and guess what that product is hot if you say this is the new hot shoe line on the planet right now people look at you and say, damn, I need to go get that same shoe line because Spec just said it was hot. So I need to go get it because it must be hot because they have influence. But when you don't have influence, you're like, yo, this is a hot shoe line. You're like, all right, whatever. Who cares? Nobody cares. <laughs> you know, and, and it's whatever. So I try to focus on how to build influence with the actual brand, that personality brands, because we not only work with celebrities, but we work with the everyday entrepreneur, aspiring entrepreneur, executive, you know, people with products, like everything. Uh, when you have something to sell and we show you how to build the influence and how to sell your products through having that influence. And there's different strategies. And I'll be here all day just going over tons of strategies on how to actually do it. But that's the secret sauce. So we have a very diverse audience tuning in right now, whether it may be entrepreneurs or even artists, what is your thought process on helping someone discover their identity, their narrative, and even their unique selling points so they can actually create content based in their lane and not try to be a jack of all trades on social media? That was, that was a great uh, question. I think everybody needs to niche down. It's the saying that says, it's the niches 
the riches and the niches. And it's there for a reason. It's because you specialize in that one thing. If you're doing multiple things, how are you going to master that one thing? And the great part about when you master one thing, you done been through it so many times, you can predict what's going to happen. But when you're doing multiple things, you got to learn multiple lessons. So like if you do 10 things, you got to learn, like if you learn, if you have 10 failures, then let's say you have one failure each thing. So now you got 10 failures, but you only learned one thing for each category. But now if you have one thing that you master and you only focus on and you have 10 failures, then now you just got 10 lessons when that one specific subject that makes you way more knowledgeable and that would push you 10 times ahead of the curve versus anybody else who's in that same exact field. Because you can predict what's going to happen because you done been through it all. You know everything. So nothing is going to phase you because you kind of, you done went through the ups and downs with it and you done AB tested everything and you are a specialist in that special field. So it's versus you going to the doctor and say, hey, this is a brain specialist versus this is a, a doctor you go in and they, tell you what's going on and, and it's just general. So the specialists get paid 10 times more than just that normal regular doctor that you go to. And the reason is because they specialize in that specific thing. I mean, the clock is continuously ticking. What could be a trend today could become extinct tomorrow. I mean, a typical example of that is social media algorithms, automation, etc. But how important is it to always stay relevant and to continuously innovate? Well, I definitely think that staying relevant is is where you get the monetized the most, right? Where attention goes, money flows. So if you can keep yourself in the spotlight as someone who's a personality brand or for your business, then the more attraction you gain for awareness for your brand. And once you start gaining the followers, you create that social proof and credibility for people to feel that you're the person who they should talk to because it's sad, but it's true. People believe in numbers, right? If you have a hundred thousand followers, you're more valuable at a million followers, right? If you got 500 followers, you're more valuable in the people's eyes with 50,000 followers. That's just how society looks at it. And you gotta, you gotta, you gotta play the game. That's just what it is. So by you knowing that is how can I focus on building my followers, gaining the influence I need for me to get the customers and the business that I want? Because you can have the same exact product. You can know the same exact knowledge. But just because you got 50,000 more followers, you're worth more. And that's crazy. The world is like that. But that's just what it is. So you have to make sure you're building your brand up. You're becoming a, a specialist in that niche and become that go to person by understanding what the people want because you done been through it all and tested everything out and you know exactly what the formula is to success to take them straight to that finish line. I mean, right now, a social media account with the amount of followers you have has more impact than your resume. If you walk into a job and you show them that you got 100,000 social media following, your credibility is sky high versus someone who's got the documentation on a piece of paper, but they really don't know how to market, how to brand. That's the new currency for 2021. I see the vision with regards to music being your passion, but it's also your marketing strategy. Because you have all these sideline businesses, but this keeps you relevant. This continuously keeps you elevating your, the eyeballs of your brand. And then you just flip it over. And that's what I do to music as well. Yeah, that's what it's about. You know, it's, that's definitely that because I have people that come to me and say, I've been to your trainings. I've been to your master classes. And now it's more people talking about my business ventures than even my music. So when you become multifaceted, like you have different fan, fan bases that you're creating. And the great part about it is all of them could integrate together collectively because the people that buy my music buys my programs. The people who buy my programs buy my music. And then when you become a thought leader in a personality brand, then you can sell whatever product you want. I can go sell a book. I can create a podcast, which I have a book. I have a podcast, right? I have, I have, 
you know, different products that I'm creating, a fitness product. I have an online business school. I have an agency. And it's all based on me being a personality and building my influence up. And now I can sell them whatever I choose to sell because I already built that credibility to them. And, and, and I'm delivering content and teaching them things and showing them things and, and bringing value that whatever I drop, they're going to support it. And I want to make sure that for the audience, we reiterate that you mastered music. You mastered the digital platform before you diversified. It's not like you decided, well, I'm just going to take a hundred swings and hopefully one's going to make me a million. You mastered it with your 10,000 hours. And then you had, you know, the opportunity to diversify from that moment onwards. Yeah. You said something really important there. Everything I did, I did it one at a time. Don't think I started a million and one businesses and, and, and just blew up on every last one of them. I literally mastered each different one piece by piece. Music came first, so 17 million records. Did that, then I transitioned to my agency. I created my agency, started making a lot of people rich off their social media, made one of the fastest growing companies in America. Did that, then I transitioned to, hey, let me do a podcast and teach people this game. Hit number one on the podcast, the Spectacular Experience podcast. Decide, okay, cool. I got a bunch of female fans. Let me create a relationship book because I realized that, you know, the, the, the actual um, relationship percentage of people staying in relationships longer than seven months with millennials. I mean, more than millennials, it's only seven months. So I was like, okay, let me take what I, I've been with my, my girl for a while and let me go ahead and give you some game with that. Boom, that hit number one. Master that. All right, got that out the way. All right, so next I decided, all right, I did all that. So now let me focus on doing an online business school. Now we have over 5,000 students. Our students is making more than $36 million uh, in the last two years. We created 17 millionaires and we're all teaching them social media and how to build a business from scratch and transition out of their nine to five job. So everything came one by one by one by one. I didn't focus on all of them at one time because now I'm spreading myself too thin. I got 100% in the bucket and I decided to take 10% here, 10% here, 10% here, 10% here, 10%. By the time you look, you only give everything a half-assed effort versus giving one thing 100%, then taking 100%, taking 20 and sit it over here to start building that with that 80% on your main thing, making your main thing your main thing. And then that 80%, then starts growing and then you can kind of let off of that and then start growing that and put somebody in charge of that, that one thing that you had at 80%. And then you focus your hundred percent on that. Why that person is, is taking over that 80% that's no longer in the main thing. Hope that made sense. Definitely does. In the beginning, it's all linear income until you turn it into passive income, until you turn it into residual income. And then you focus 1% on that as opposed to the 99% you did in the beginning to build up that foundation. And let me say this too, because a lot of people don't understand. When people say you got to have multiple sources of income, it does not mean that you need to go start five businesses from scratch, right? What it means is you get that one business and you build it up as the most successful as possible, you take the money from that, and when you take the money from this business, you invest in the other teams, all right? Other teams and other companies that's already built that you can literally invest money in in their management. And I only invest money in the things that I know I can bring value to and help. So if shit hit the fan, I can jump in and help the business out versus investing in something I know nothing about. Warren Buffett say, I only swing at balls that I can hit. So you don't have to swing at a million balls, just the one that you know. If you hit curveballs, every time you see a curveball, knock it out the park. But don't try to hit a fastball, a slider. Don't try to hit nothing else but curveballs because you know every time a curveball comes, you're going to knock it off the park. And focus on that. Build the business up. And then another thing is, if you are going to build multiple businesses, then you got to find the person that's going to run the business. All right. So now if you do build it up to a certain point, you let it go. You put somebody in charge that's going to run the business. You can build another company up, build it to the point where you put somebody in charge and let them run the business. But at all times, you have that operation person who knows about numbers, finance and structure and have them run your company. So imperative because then you start shifting from CEO of the business to CEO of your own life. And that's what people miss. They chase CEO because it's a title. 
they miss that they don't have a life. So we want to get onto the beach so we can work from the phones. That's the most important thing. Hey, I want you to take a quick split second off your time. All I want you to do is hit the subscribe button and turn on your notifications. I want to update you when I have a next iconic guest on my show. Stay in student mode. What's up? It's spectacular. And you tuned into the Millionaire Student Show with Sasha. I've heard you say your input is your output. And there's multiple ways people utilize social media today. Two ways that stand out for me is either looking at it from a supplier's point of view, which is a business-related point of view, or from a consumer's point of view where people actually get so addicted and distracted. But how does one control and manage their social media as opposed to be owned and be becoming a victim to it? One way you can do it is just put restrictions on the time you can be on your phone. You can literally do that from your phone, right? Put a time frame to it and stay disciplined to it. All right. Another thing is you can reverse hack social media. You can go out, put everybody on mute and program whatever you want to program your mind to do because your thoughts become reality. So if you Go and you follow all the inspirational people, all the people that's killing it, all the people that's going to motivate you, all the pages that's going to uh, teach you things, and then all your competition, then you can literally just have that diet, right? Purge. Do a purge. Uh, mute every. You ain't got to unfollow them. Mute everybody and just follow every last person and, and, un, and do not mute the people that you want to, to become like the, the, the people, the person, like whatever that vision is you have as a person, those are the people you want to go follow. And then now when you get on social media, your mind is getting programmed. Your, your news feed is getting programmed. Your discovery, your, your discovery tab is getting programmed. So when you come on your discovery tab, you see every last thing that you want to program, program your mind to see, right? You go in your feed, you see all inspirational, all motivational, all learning things, and you got no choice but to make it into a learning process versus a distraction. You make it an asset instead of a liability. Right now, the way a lot of people are using social media, it becomes a liability. It's taking up all your time. You're not you're not pro proactive. You're not you're not being uh, uh you're not you're not having a lot of pro productivity. But it once you switch the narrative. And you control it based on what you want, then all of, be, all of a sudden it becomes an asset to you. When you go on social media for two hours, you just learn for two hours. You got the shit motivated out of you for two hours. You just, you know, uh, 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 scoped out your competition for two hours. And now you know what your competition is doing. So you just got to really reverse engineer and hack. I mean, not reverse engineer, but you got you to gotta hack that, hack the system. And every human being goes through three phases in life in no particular order, prosperity, adversity, and plateaus. And you've actually plateaued multiple times in your life, as you mentioned with, you know, music, with regards to social media and the algorithms, etc. What traits should one develop whilst going through a plateau or even adversities in life? The main thing you got to do is just figure out your support system. It's organizations you can join. One is called an entrepreneur organization. I just launched an organization called Power Circle. Uh, you can go to powercircles.org and apply to be a part of the Power Circle. Um, all you got to do is make over $100,000 in revenue to join the Power Circle. And it's a collective effort, you know, of people who all want to get to the same place in life, which is success. You know, people want to make an impact and you... You figure out who your support system is and you meet, meet once a month with those people, mastermind, brainstorm, figure out what are, what are each other challenges? What are you going through? What can I help you with? All right. What, 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 what am I going through that you can help me with? And when you build this support system, then when you go through those times, those dark times, you got people that's going to pull you out of that dark space. Because you're going to pull them out of the dark spaces when they go through it and vice versa. And when you build this, this is going to be the most powerful thing for you. No matter how, how small you start off with your support group, your mastermind group, and you talk about 
business best, business worst, personal best, personal worst, and you get business therapy and personal therapy, and you meet once a month to get that out and make sure everything is confidential, then you start seeing your, your whole life accelerate. It'll never be a dull moment. It'll never be a dull moment. It'll never be a down moment that you can't, you can't climb up out of. So let's dissect your entrepreneurship mind for a moment. What foundational systems do you need to implement to run your multi-million dollar company? Well, some of the systems I use, one is Slack, a communication tool system. Uh, the other task management system is Asana. I use the EOS system, entrepreneur operation system. It's a whole breakdown of what that is, how it works. You can get a trainer. I get a trainer, an implementer trainer that comes in and coaches me and my team uh, every single quarter on goals, on accountability issues, things like that. Uh, you can read a book called Traction to, to figure out how to exactly implement these, these different things in, in EOS. And there's another book that's called uh, What is EOS? All right. And then the third thing you want to do is you want to read a book called Rocket Fuel. And it basically explains the relationship versus the VI relationship, which is the visionary and the integrator. The visionary is the person who comes up with all the ideas, the person who actually creates the relationships, you know, the, the person that actually are creating the content and doing the interviews. Then you have the integrator, which is the person who runs the organization, sets up the system, sets up the operations, runs the day to day of the business. And it explains how, you know, this is Batman and Robin. All right. Or even Batman really is Batman and, and Alfred, because Alfred was the person who ran his operations, created his gadgets and and did his systems. And Batman was the one out fighting the crime. All right. So same thing with Warren Buffett. Everybody knows Warren Buffett, but not too many people know Charlie Munger. But Charlie Munger was the operation person and Warren Buffett was the visionary. He was the guy who was going to be in front of the spotlight. He was the guy who was going to campaign. He was going to be the guy that was building the relationships. So explain that. Uh, and then the last thing I would say is uh, DISC. DISC, bankcode.com, and learn about personality types. What drives somebody? What motivates them? What makes them move? How to communicate with them? Because what, what goes on in the, in the workspace or even in relationships is that you think we're speaking the same language, but we're really not. You speak por Portuguese, I speak Italian, right? And two different languages. I don't even know Italian is a language. Let me say, let me say Creole, right? So, so basically you have two different languages and we're both trying to talk to each other, but you're not understanding me and I'm not understanding you. But the only way for me and you to connect is when I speak Creole and you speak Creole. And then when I'm talking, when you're talking to, when I'm talking to you, I got to talk Creole to you because you talk Creole. When you're talking to me, I speak Spanish. So you got to speak Spanish to me. So when you're communicating with the same language, now we can connect. Because so many times we just, we, we, we don't see eye to eye and in, in, in as individuals, as employers or employees, because what motivates me and drives me don't motivate and drive you. So we got to figure out what moves you and what makes you who you are and how you like to be communicated with, right? I'm going to give you an example. So they have something that's called an action, right? Red action. Actions like to be like the win, competitive, and, and like things quick. A knowledge is somebody who likes to analyze everything, real analytical, and they want to explain everything. They want to see everything, right? So when a knowledge is talking to me, they need to talk to me fast, quick, and, and get straight to the point. When I'm talking to a knowledge, I got to break everything down to them. Even though I don't like to, to I like to be quick. I don't want to be like they're all there explaining shit. But since I know that this is that person personality, I have to sit down and communicate in their own language. So I got to come and break everything down. I got to literally be analytical. I got to be logical with them. I got to show them everything. I got to show them the numbers. And that's how we communicate. So those different things makes a huge impact in business. It's like you becoming a chameleon and you got to change your color to go out there and uh, to, to be on the same level as them. But what key performance indicators do you track in business which which actually positions you to make the decision to scale to walk away to reinvest more cash flow 
is making money. No, I was just joking. <laughs> uh, I mean, a great KPI. I mean, it's KPIs in every department from my sales department, marketing department, uh, my admin department, my customer service department, and every last, every last department has their own KPIs. So we just got to make sure we just stay within those KPIs and we give bonuses and incentives based on uh, KPIs. If you give the right person the right courage and the right incentives, they can, they can take over the world. You know, I had somebody on my team that they was doing great, but when I gave them the incentives, it took off, right? And then as it started taking off even more, I started motivating them and it took off even more. So as a mentor motivating and giving incentives, I've started seeing those KPIs get hit and superseded by far, like it, like literally blowing past it. So just remember those things. When you're literally coming in your business and you have employees or a spouse or anything like motivation and incentives that go even for your kids, right? You give them incentive. I say, yo, go go clean your room, right? Go clean your room. Nine out of 10, they probably won't go clean the room. But if I say, hey, you go clean this room, I'm going to give you this game and I'm going to give you this game and we going to do this. You got this. Let's go. All of a sudden, that room getting clean like that because I gave them a sentiment and I gave them motivation and courage. And, and now you can accomplish everything you set your mind to uh, with your team and, and your, your family or, or whoever you're building relationships with. Speck, who has been one of the most interesting individuals you've been inspired and shifted by? I would have to say my mentor, Jeff Hoffman. I tell this story all the time, man. Um, me being in the music industry, and I used to be this snooty duty guy. I'm not even going to lie. I was snooty duty. I, nobody could really talk to me. Like I was, I was in the clouds, right? And then I met my mentor, Jeff Hoffman. And it was this one scenario that I love telling this story because I don't know who else is going to impact. I was speaking in Hawaii for my very first keynote speech ever. And I looked on the ballot and I seen that my mentor was speaking too, because he's a keynote speaker. And when I seen Jeff Hoffman on there, I was like, wow. I was like, that's my mentor is here to see me speak. I was excited. I was like, oh man, I told him I was nervous. He was like, man, you're a performer. You got this, bro. You've been on stage. You're a natural. And I mean, I was cussing everybody out, everything. I was just that nervous, right? And so I, I, I perform, I, I killed it on stage. Then it's lunchtime. Now, mind you, the organization called EO, you have to make a minimum of a million dollars to give it, even get considered. So I was speaking in front of all top-notch entrepreneurs and killed it. So now it's lunchtime. Now everybody's at the table, right? So now I, this is another part of, be part of the story. So this guy sitting at the table and he was bragging about how much money he was making. It's like, yeah, man, you know, I did 15 million my first year, man. I'm killing it. And he's like bragging and stuff. He was like, you know what? And, and this year we set out to do 25 million. And then he looks at my mentor and he was like, what you do? And my mentor looked at him and he was like, well, you ever heard of Priceline.com? <laughs> it's like, yeah, I booked my ticket on that to get here. It's like, yeah, okay. I sold that for $64 billion. So the guy face just dropped. Like, and that was from that point forward, I was like, I would never go bragging on how much money I make to anybody just because you just never know, right? It's like, be humble. That was a humbling, a humbling experience even for me to see that, that happened to him. So now after that, my mentor got up and he looked at me, we was eating and he was like, you want, you want something to drink? Because he felt like I was thirsty. I was like, man, if you don't sit your billion dollar butt down, you are not getting up to get me no water. So I was like, no, I'm good. He was like, no, stay right there. I got you. And then my girl was with me. She was like, all right, I'm gonna get you something too. She's like, no, 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 we're good. This man walked like literally like 15, 15, 20 feet away to go come with a bunch of waters and everything and come back to give me something because he felt like I was thirsty. So what that did for me, it showed me that I'm never too big for anybody. Like what that guy made in a lifetime with his net worth is, $67 $67 billion and for him to literally get up because he felt like I needed something for him to serve me and go out out of his way to bring that, that made a huge impact. So from that day forward, I was like, I'm never too big for anybody. I don't care if you're a bum on the street. 
I don't care if you're an intern. I don't care if you're the CEO of Disney. You're all going to get cr- created. I mean, tr- um, uh, you're all going to be treated the same regardless. I don't, I don't care because he showed me that it doesn't matter how much money you got, don't matter how much fame you got, don't matter how much money you got in your bank account, it don't matter how much influence you have. People are people. People are people. And if I can help, I'm going to help. And it's something that small of going to get a water because he felt like I needed help at that moment, right? It wasn't like a, a, a huge help. It's like, yeah, you know, I'm eating, but I don't have anything to drink. He noticed that. And he took action without me even having to ask him anything or even me even going to do, do it myself. He seen it was an issue and he got up out of his way. And even though I turned him down, he still went and did it and be like, I know you need this. So here you go. And I, I, I applied it to my whole life. I mean, we're all going to pass away one day and the street sweeper gets buried right next to the CEO. There's no difference when we all pass away. But we got to be able to understand that our top line in life is someone else's bottom line. Our pinnacle is someone else's entry level. And that's why humility is so key to get to the next level. Spec, it's so vital and imperative to find mentors, to shorten and expand our learning curve because what starts to happen is we decrease the mistakes we are about to make when we find that mentors already made that mistakes. What percentage would you tell people that you're mentoring that they should take from their monthly income and reinvest into mentorship, whether it's self-development courses, events, et cetera? Listen, I would invest everything I can without hurting myself. It comes back tenfold. The best investment you can make is in yourself. Period. If you can, if, if, if I had, if I had savings, if I had $10,000 in my bank account and I had a mentor that I know is what I want to be at in life, I would give him my whole 5,000 if I know my bills was this much. Like if I know I have enough to pay my bills for next month and enough to pay my bills for this month and like I know I have that money coming in, but I know I can literally give, I can, I can give this money and invest in myself, then I'm willing to invest every last dollar because once I get that person as a mentor, I know I'm going to make 10x that money. The wealthy invest in things that they, can, they, they feel is going to bring them a 10x in investments. I mean, in return. So if you're going to make a decision, then you just got to look at that one thing and say, okay, if I, if I choose to entertain this or invest in this, will it bring me a 10X in return? So if I get this guy $5,000, do I feel like he's at least going to help me make $50,000 or save me $50,000 in mistakes? And if the answer is yes, then I have no problem. My biggest investments come off from, from investments in myself. That's what majority of my investments go in myself. Learning programs, I buy programs. Um, I I do ment- I get mentorship. I get consultants. Um, I go through life experiences. Everything is about mentoring myself, right? Even even sometimes you can mentor yourself, right? It's like yo, let me talk to myself and say like, what would I do in this situation if I had this? What would I do in this situation if I was already there? Like, and kind of like talk to myself and talk it out with myself so you don't have to make moves when you're desperate. You know, when you're desperate, that's when you make the worst decisions. So you got to kind of think to yourself, like, if I was here, would I do that? And kind of talk to yourself and talk it out and ask yourself those questions to get real life answers. There's three people that we can never ever negotiate on. Number one, being a mentor. Number two, a lawyer. And number three, an accountant. When you have those three pillars embedded, what starts to happen is you can save more money in taxes. You're going to get screwed over and sued one day. So you protect yourself. And a mentor is just shortening that curve. But you and your team built up a company which got recognized for the Inc. 5000 and 262 out of 18 million companies. What is your process in identifying talent in leadership? Well, I think one of the things that you need with talent is always be recruiting. Always recruit. If you look at the best of the best teams, it's because they're always recruiting. Some of these colleges, they're recruiting when kids are in 
freaking optimists. They already have the eye on the prize and was like, you know, this kid is going to come play for me. And they already know that that person is going to be something. So they put their eye on it and they start nurturing that person throughout the process. So just making sure that you keep an eye out on talent, you find a, a talent track, start teaming up with these schools on finding out what's their number one talents that's coming. You know, you want to make sure that, that you have, you have a, um, you have a recruiter. A recruiter is great. Call it apple picking or head hunter and find someone who's going to pick out somebody who's worked for somebody else. Cause when you do a job application, those are all people got fired. You don't want the people got fired. You want to, you want the people that somebody don't want to let go. Right. And you, you sell them on your mission, your values and, and the impact you're going to make. And, and they want to be a part of that. Right. Versus just being a number that work for somebody and you can really get some key employees just from that and just leading them based off of what they want in life. Getting them to their goals, what matters to them, showing that you give a damn. It's not all about money. It's really about what can you do to help develop that person. I mentor all my staff. Like I'm that's who I am. I'm a mentor to them. So just recently I read a book, Who Moved My Cheese? And it's so imperative to understand the cheese is always going to be moved. We need to always find new cheese. New blood is a lifeblood to the business. And when people get complacent, you got to replace them with new fresh blood because that inspires them internally. What are some of your strengths of your leadership team right now? Well, some of our strengths are the way that we work together. You know, making sure we leave no man behind and we're always learning. And the third thing is, is ownership. You know, if it's late night, something happens, you got to you got to get up. You got to make it happen. I heard Elon Musk call his team in the middle of the night some nights, like 3 a.m. Like, what's up? I need all y'all here right now. And the people that don't show up, they fire. He asked them to get something done. If they don't get it done, it's like, all right, you fire. Find somebody that can get it done for me. Right. And it's like ownership It's like we got a mission. We got a goal. You got to go all in and nothing. You're either putting all your chips in or you ain't on the team. And when everybody have that CEO mindset and understand I am the CEO of my department. And, and if this department fails, then I'm failing. It's not, oh, this is the CEO. The CEO is getting rich. No, we're, we have a vision. We have a goal and we're going to get there together. Everybody got to be on the same, same foot at the same time. Left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot. And we got to make sure that we're all on the same page. We all have the same values and, and, and live by those values. You know, learning, leadership, uh, uh, stream ownership, like, and make sure that we're pushing each other to success and always learning. Never, never settle for great. Like, I want to be unstoppable. I want my team to be unstoppable and get that mentality that is not about me. It's about the company. What's best for the company? What's best for the people we're impacting, right? We're changing lives every single day. To say that we had 36 million in revenue for my students and have 5,000 students in the last two years, that's impactful. So you're not here because it's spectacular. You're here because of these students. You're here because this is going to create financial freedom and generational wealth for these students, right? So that's our mission. That's our goal. So when something is broken and you sleep and you know that shit is broken, you don't go to sleep on me and just like not wake up and say, hey, I deal with it tomorrow. No, you get up and you make it happen. You make sure you fix it and you hit me up and say, hey, do you need anything else? You know, and oh, I found this issue too. And I, and I fixed that for you. So don't worry about that. I handled that already. Right. It's called proactive, not waiting for me to tell you something. So my team, that's how we are. You know, we make sure that we on point and we we are accountable to our own stuff. Spec, someone new that's going into business, what mistakes would you advise them not to make that actually burnt your fingers? I would say keeping your keeping your keeping your eye on your business. You know, that whole multiple sources of income got me caught up. You know, I had my business at the time. We was one of the fastest growing companies in America. I felt like it was on autopilot. I felt like it was great. And I took my eye off of it to do something else. And when I took my eye off the business, I didn't have it set up in a way where it can really run on autopilot. And even if I did have it set up in a way 
to run on autopilot, I would never take more than 80% of focus off of it. You know, I would never go past that 80%, right? I would never go lower than that, I mean. And, and making sure that if I do take my attention off, it's only going to be 20%. Because when, when it's going good, you got to smash on the, on, the, on the gas even harder. And what I did was I, I started doing good and I let off the gas because I felt like I was great. They call it the honeymoon stage, right? You're in the honeymoon stage. You feel like everything is great. You want to go on vacation. You want to go on a break. It's like, nah. When you're doing good, this is the time to double down. This is the time to put all your chips in, like, let's go. And that's, that's why I messed up one. I could have made 10x the amount of money that I made if I didn't let my foot off the gas. So now that taught me a huge lesson that when things are going great, go even harder. Don't get complacent. Don't feel like it's good now. No, that's when you say, I now was really time to put in some work. This thing is doing good. It's killing it. Now I need to kill it times 100. When I kill it times 100, how can I get to 1,000 now? And you just keep going and start building on your team. Start building on your team. Start recruiting, getting those A players, right? Go get your AD, your, your LeBron James, your Rondos, your, 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 uh, your J.R. Smith off the bench, or your Dwight Howard's off the bench to go win the championship. I mean, a typical example of that is Jeff Bezos. He only owns 11% of Amazon, and yet the guy is worth over $150 billion. He focused in his lane, he mastered it, and he's still focusing on it. He could do anything in the world, but it's most important to resell yourself on what you're doing, just like how you talk about that in a successful relationship. What's your short-term strategy for the next few months with this pandemic and the recession right now? Right now, I'm just building on my team. I'm building on my team and just getting the best of the best. A lot of people getting laid off, but I'm hiring. <laughs> I'm hiring. I want the best of the best. Like you said, I want an all-star team, and I want to double down on my talent and make sure I got the, the, the best talent so we can really impact as many people as possible so I don't have to worry about too many things in the business. And I know that it's going to be people that's just like me that is going to help take this vision to the next level because it's not about me. It's about the people and it's about the people who really want to take a real step forward to change their life and to give them the options that's going to really give them that freedom that they're looking for. Because I feel like people are lost right now. They don't have the right tools. They don't have the right guidance. And that's what I'm here to do. I'm here to give them the guidance. I'm here to give them all the tools. I've seen a lot of things. I've been through a lot. And now I'm here to shortcut the way to success. Take it from the back of the line, put them to the front of the line in the VIP section. Spec, let's switch gears and dissect relationships for a moment before we close out. I know you wrote a book based on relationships. What are the essential elements of a lasting relationship? Man, I, I kind of talked about it earlier. It's communication. Make sure we're all on the same page, right? And the same way we handle businesses is the same way we need to handle our relationships have goals, have projections, have meetings, right? What's working, what's not working, issue lists, like accountability, like all of these are things that you need, not only in your business, but in your relationship. You have a, a mission statement for your business, but you ain't got a mission statement for your relationship. You got core values for your business, but you ain't got core values for your relationship, right? You having monthly meetings and leadership meetings, but it's only two people in this meeting and you're not having, you're not having no meetings. You're not talking about things that is going to drive the relationship for, but you'll talk about what's going to drive the business for. <laughs> you'll talk about how you just lost a client and how can we make this better so we don't lose another client, but we're not figuring out how you got pissed off at something and how can we fix that to make sure that don't happen again so we can move forward and learn from our mistakes. So I think that's the core thing. And co-creating is so vital because when you leave your significant other behind and you're winning and they're not, what starts to happen is they're left out. They feel left out or even right out. And you want to make sure that you co-create with them. Talk to me about how to make good love lost. Yeah, you make it last by making sure that you guys are experiencing the best of the best with each other. You know, exploring each other. One, the things that you like, might not be the things that she likes, you know, or he likes, vice versa. And when you visit each other's world, 
is when you can tap more into the relationship because sometimes you find yourself realizing that, well, I don't want to go there because I don't like that. You know, I don't want to go spend this time with him and go there because I don't like the way they be doing this over there. But the reality is, if you visit that person's world and say, hey, I know I don't like doing this, but I'm going to do it for you. And I know that you don't like this when I do this, but I want you to come with me and experience this with me. So now you're both visiting each other's worlds and both of you guys are bending for each other. And now you get to really spend that quality time and get that real connection based on the things that you enjoy as a person, as an individual. But so many times you're like, oh, I don't like that. He go do that and I don't want to do all that. Like, I'm good. I don't like that. And then you do the same thing with, with your spouse. You're like, ah, oh, she does. She's doing that. I don't like doing that. Like, I'm cool. I, like, this, that's irritating. But she would be happy if you was in there with her doing that one thing. And you may be happy with her being with you as company doing that one thing. But if you both compromise and, 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 and take a step back to take 10 steps forward for that person to enjoy that moment with you and share that moment with you, then both of you guys are able to, to really see the, the, you know, the amazing um, fruits of, of being in a relationship and tapping into each other's uh, adventures and, and things that you guys love and, and get to experience it together. Speck, in wrapping up, what does self-talk and your internal dialogue with yourself sound like? Self-talk um, is me knowing that I could accomplish anything I put my mind to, knowing that no one on earth that accomplished something that I will want to accomplish, that I can't accomplish the same thing. If I put my time, energy, and effort into it, I'll be able to accomplish the same thing, you know, building the right relationships, setting myself up for success, getting battle ready, battle tested. And, uh, and when I fall down and get up and dust myself off to know that after every storm, the sun comes out, you know, and, and just tell myself that everything that I want to do, I, I will do. And that's really that. How can people connect with you? Man, if you guys want to go through one of my trainings, I have a training um, that I teach you how to build a business on social media, how to monetize, how to automate your social media and how to grow followers by hundreds of thousands of followers. Um, I have a free training uh, that you guys can go to. You can text me 786-661-1224. Text me hashtag masterclass. Um, and you can jump on my training. I actually have a training this week that you guys can jump on it. And, uh, and learn some of these strategies, man. And at the end of the training, I talk about my online business school, uh, my Master in Business Affluence program, so you guys can master business wealth, transition out of your nine to five to create your own company, your own brand, and your own products. And, uh, and yeah, take your life to the next level. So once again, 786-661-1224 takes the hashtag masterclass. Um, and also, I have a podcast called The Spectacular Experience as the number one podcast on the top 200 charts on Apple music, uh, on Apple podcasts. So check it out. Um, and yeah, follow me on Instagram. I am spectacular. And, uh, on TikTok is spectacular Smith. And yeah, everything else is, I am spectacular. Facebook, Twitter, everything. Spec is there a website because for the international audience, instead of texting, is there a website that they can visit and tune into that, uh, free yeah. training? Yeah, go to spectacularmasterclass.com. Great. Spec, thank you so much for your time. I truly appreciate it. Thank you for the wisdom, the knowledge, your presence, and most importantly, just being you. Thank you for having me, brother. Appreciate you.